In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Against that epic backdrop of the first reading, and the ponderous colloquy of Jeremiah and Hananiah, against the invocation of lost, legendary Babylon, with its associated welter of memory and apocalyptic metaphor, against St. Paul's discourse on sin and its dominion over mortal flesh, and against talk of prophecy and wickedness, righteousness and reward. Against all these things we've heard this morning, how startlingly, almost incongruously accessible is that image Jesus uses at the heart of that short gospel, a cup of cold water, a timelessly recognisable commodity, which, especially given the humidity of London over the last few weeks, meets our senses with a sharpness, with an appealing reality that we might admit often we don't sense. It stands out from the rightly, magnificently otherworldly liturgical and scriptural context and reminds us of the reality of what we're doing here, a reality to which Jeremiah and Paul bear witness and to which we are called to do likewise, to make real in and by our lives. Simple, <coughs> essential, clear that glass of water. All words, we can be honest in admitting, don't always coincide with our religious experience. Faith and doubt, questions of fairness, of suffering, hopeless wrangles over matters of ethics. But I am certain that grace is at work this, in this happily ordinary translation of the gospel. The meeting point we're offered in this cup of cold water presents us with an opportunity to begin to understand the complexity and wonder and fed-upness and fudge in which we often find ourselves. For the Spirit points us through the suggestion of this simple offering to simple but essential truths about what is offered to us in this place and what we are called in turn to offer to the world. I wonder if any of you share that feeling of worthily entering, say, Waterstone's Piccadilly. <clears throat> Over one shoulder, your Daunt Books tote bag, that ubiquitous livery of the middle classes, but leaving with a sense of despair, having been overwhelmed with possibility. Well, I could read about Sienese painting, but then there's that new book on Gen John Maynard Keynes. And then what about the one on the Forty Years' War? But then probably I ought to have a go at the brothers Karamazov, and there's a very hands handsome edition over there. But then perhaps something a little more contemporary. It's a small and silly example of a human state of being that gets itself lost in contingency, possibility, a sense of alienation, a tragic apprehension of what, in a sense, could be, but which, given our limitations, can't. It happens more seriously in our ethical lives, too. The look over the shoulder of whomever we're talking to at a gathering, towards the person we think we might like to be talking to. The insidious but very real ranking of friends, colleagues, potential suitors. The general neglect of what we have, have at our disposal, of what grace has decreed, rather blessed us with, for some idea of what we might be, what we'd like to be, and what modern life, cruel in its superficial generosity, tells us we really deserve. Likewise, the ignoring of other perspectives, the refusal to listen through fear or laziness because we haven't cultivated that gentleness and patience of soul 
that quietly sure of its own worth enables us truly to be alongside others. So I'm extremely grateful for the startling clarity of that cup of cold water because it points us to the compelling, liberating, difficult truth that Jesus, imminent, ever-present, the founding principle of this great world, gives us all we need to work with. As you leave All Saints today, or as you join us after Mass in the bar for a cup of cold water or something a little stronger, look at the inscription above that door, Christum Scire Est Omnia Scire. To know Christ is to know all, to know everything. The particular obscure teacher of those mild peaks of Galilee is the same who underpins all creation, all time, all circumstance. And this is made practically clear for us this morning when we're comforted and challenged that when we offer a cup of water to one of those little ones, we offer it to him. And that works the other way as well. We shouldn't be, as Christians, consciously grasping for any other reward than the peace of Christ, the clarity of Christ, the quiet humility that comes in knowing him. This is not some shallow game with God. Jesus in the little ones, Jesus as those little ones, is to honour their God-given honourable existence and at the same time our own. It is not a test or a trick. We're comforted today, our attention struck by that simple, essential glass of cold water, by the implication, by the command, that what life throws our way is the material we are called to deal with. That what life throws our way is the material we, each of us, are called to deal with. The people we come across are the people God calls us to be alongside. The places we find ourselves in are the places he calls us to understand, to love, to be changed by, to enjoy, to cope with, with the grace of God to help to transfigure. It's a lesson to me in my superficial example of the Waterstones meltdown, but one with wider implications, that so much is worth reading, so much is worth paying attention to. And though this will necessarily limit our purview, cut us off, yes, from some of what theoretically might have been, in the depth to which it takes us, will bring us closer to God, the source of all knowledge, the balm of all heartfelt experience, the principle of all things. Rejoice that the world, dearest, freshness, deep down things is unpartisanly charged with the glory of God. Go out from here and in every instant, every experience, every encounter, enjoy meeting him who made us and redeemed us out of love. Amen.